Alright, so finally made it out to the Vans Aircraft booth and tackled, literally tackled Greg to talk about this RV15. Greg, introduce yourself and a little bit of the news what's going on here. Sure. Hey Brian, my name is Greg Hughes. I'm the Vice President at Vans Aircraft and the COO. And I'm standing here in front of the RV15 engineering prototype. Pretty sweet airplane that we've got, we put together. Flew for the first time, probably just a little over a month ago actually. Put enough hours and did enough, got enough of the testing done to be able to get it here to Oshkosh, the prototype, to be able to show to everybody. And we've got a lot of dead grass around it right now. It's been a been a pretty wild few days, but we're pretty excited about the airplane. Uh, it's a full-size real airplane. It's got a Lycoming IO390 EXP119, so that's putting out typically dynos around 218 or a little higher, 220 horsepower. Somewhere in there, it's got an 80-inch Hartzell composite constant speed pop on the front. This thing, it's a beast. It's an elevator, right? I mean, it takes off, and when it goes, it goes. It takes off short, Lands nice and short. We haven't even expanded the full speed envelope yet. That's still next iterations in our test phase. So we, people have been asking, to get it here, we needed to do a certain amount of the envelope in order to be able to safely operate it and know that we could confidently and safely fly it here and then fly it back home so that we could show it to people and people could see it. So with 200 horsepower, over 200 horsepower, Vans well, has decided well, well over 200. Well over 200 horsepower. Vans has decided to go full bush on this for a bush plane. Yeah, I mean, it's a util real utility airplane. Purpose of this is to be able to get a couple people in this airplane and load it up with stuff. Go out and go somewhere. Go do whatever. Go camping. Go fishing. Go camping and fishing. Do wherever it is that you're going. Be able to go cross country. Be able to get in short. Get out short. Just to do the job really, really well but also to deliver a kit that you can build consistently and reliably a good safe airplane and a nicely performing airplane that is in the context of the mission that we're talking about, total performance. All right, Greg, so what do we know about uh, performance numbers at the moment for uh, like, you know, takeoff and climb out and cruise and all that kind of stuff? Well, we've seen, we've certainly seen a couple of the videos we posted, you actually see how short the takeoffs are, right? They're in well under 400 feet well under in, in cases. Uh, again, we haven't explored that entire envelope yet. The cruise speeds that we're seeing, we also have, we have not gone to the top of the envelope yet. So, but our target cruise speed is 140 knots, right? I don't, I don't believe based on what we know so far that we're gonna have a problem getting there. I think we're pretty darn confident about that. And is that with the baby tires or the bush wheels? That was with the baby tires. Okay. So with the bush wheels, I mean, it's drag, right? Drag's drag and you know, you can overcome you can overcome a little bit of drag with a lot of horsepower. So, but those are trade-offs and decisions for the mission that the owner or pilot is going to choose to operate on. Changing the tires on these things, these these Behringer wheels, is a really quick thing. It's pretty easy to do. Not not that big of a deal. And on that topic, on the baby wheels, will you offer? a wheel pant to make it as quick as possible? Well, that's a good question. There's been some discussion around that. We don't have any decisions on that yet, but you know, I mean, it's entirely possible. So, all right, Greg, let's, let's touch on the construction of this, right? One of the first things you see walking up to this, to my surprise, is a lot of pop rivets. There's still some solid AN I see along the spar. Yep. Is this gonna make it into production? Yes. Yes. So, we're, we're currently finishing up and doing the work. One of our engineers who worked at Boeing for years and did material test analysis has been doing hundreds and hundreds of tests on different types of sheet metal and different quality of hole and deburred or not deburred, dimpled or not dimpled, uh, solid flush rivets, pop flush rivets or pulled rivets. These are the LP4-3, it's the same rivet we use on the RV-12, this pulled rivet. And uh, what we've discovered, and we're still working on finalizing, you have to data upon data upon data, but you know, if we're able to validate it, the intent is to be able to offer this, as you see it here, as a primarily pulled rivet airplane on the outside, uh, or give you the option using exactly the same uh, pre-punch matched final size holes to be able to do a solid rivet in that dimple it and then put a solid rivet in it and squeeze it right and that would be that would be a soft rivet as opposed to the hard rivet I mean to do to do that size of a, of a, of a hard rivet that's a lot of work and a lot of air going into it but with the softer rivet you can do that so the analysis we're doing is what's the structural benefit you get from that the fatigue life of that and whatnot and the numbers that we're seeing look really really good for being able to offer that as an option so from an engineering standpoint and also having many many years of experience building these what do you think 
What, are your, what is your guesstimate on a build time on either or? Solid A and rivet, and then what's the time savings of pull rivets? I have no idea exactly what the time savings will be, but given the number of rivets that goes into an airplane this size, I think it's pretty significant. I mean, I think it's going to be quite significant, the difference. But somebody that wants to do that trade-off, wants to trade their time for a flush rivet airplane, will have the option to do it. All right, so sticking on to the airframe topic here, let's talk about these great big barn door flaps and ailerons and, and uh, the performance of them. These flaps are huge. Right, they're not full span, but they're. I mean, the aileron's got a great big, a great big deep port on it, a really big long flap. This is the test article, right? So for test purposes, these flaps will actually go out to 50 degrees. 50. So five zero degrees. 50 degrees. But well, for engineering test purposes, right? We're going, we're going pretty extreme. That's an air brake, Greg. It's, That's an air brake. It's a little more than an air brake, actually. But <laughs> that doesn't mean that 50 degrees will go on the final airplane, right? Okay. Not necessarily. But the point is, we're testing it out to that point. So the, the entire point of this test airplane, this is a throwaway airplane, right? This airplane will get cut up and scrapped when we're done with it. It's not a production airplane, but the idea is test all of the configuration things, find out in the real world how they actually work. Iterate through the process of making different changes, small iterative changes, do that quickly, right? So fly it like this, get to that point. If we need to make changes or tweaks because we discover, hey, you know, if we did this, we think it'd be better. We have everything in house to be able to do that, right? So whether it's a CNC piece or a punched piece or what have you, so we take that, we iterate, we do the next test flight, and then we decide what we think. Maybe we go back to what we have, or maybe we stick with what the new thing is, but that's the process that we're going through. So these flaps are are really, really big, right? They're, there's no doubt about it. Um, that's pretty cool. It's kind of a nifty design. Uh, whether it makes 50 degrees on the final airplane or not, I would say it's pretty likely that it won't, but, um, but the testing is what will tell us that. Another thing on this you know, is we have we hear from people two things about doors. Number one is the door that you get in and out of needs to be big enough to be and easy enough to get in and out of and to see out of. But also a baggage door. So what do you want to do for a baggage door? Give me as big a baggage door as possible. So structurally what we've done is we have a baggage door. So if there's a, just for comparison purposes, people might be familiar with the Cessna 180. The Cessna 180 has a baggage door that goes from here to here and ours is just a bit wider. Right? And so the idea here was for for a reasonably largely sized person is can I get my shoulders in there? Because a baggage door that you can get your shoulders through is a pretty useful baggage door. So from a practical perspective, we wanted to make sure that people would be able to have ease of loading and unloading. You, you put the hell hole on the side of the airplane. Yeah, well, but the, but the but the but the door, like the we got a bunch of people looking at it right now, but but the actual doors on the sides that you get in and out of from an ingress egress perspective are they're super super easy to get in and out of. You slide the seat forward, you can take a, a full size mountain bike, you can stick it in there. Your baggage bulkhead's way back here, right? Slide it in there, take the front wheel off, put it on a little clamp, put it on the floor, and throw the wheel in next to it take off and go fly. Greg, moving from the uh, the cargo baggage door into the full interior, explain, it. is this gonna be just a two-seater with baggage, lots of baggage, or is there room for a jump seat or? Yeah, so we're talking about a jump seat. So especially, eventually, initially this is a tri I'm sorry, this is a conventional gear, right? The all metal tail dragger is not dead, everybody, right? Here we are. Uh, we will work on a tricycle variant as well. A tricycle variant, maybe for training purposes, we might look at something like putting a, an observer seat or a single jump seat in the back. Sort of a two plus two configuration is what we're really considering at this point in time. Okay. So you know, there's, there's room in here to put two real people. Uh, you know, this, this fuel tank in here is just a, t uh, a test article fuel sure. cell. The, the fuel will go in the wings, you know, like, like an RV, the way it should be. Uh, but the idea is to get two people in here and a lot of stuff, right? and to be able to go wherever you need to go and stay for a while. That's really, really the design, the mission design goal around this airplane. Okay, very good. One thing I saw on your uh, your first video, which I think you had confirmed later, but just to go ahead and put it on video here, the pull handles that are taped to the side of the cabin. Yep. What is that for? What's that out? So Axel, our test pilot, you know, is flying a brand new airplane that has never been flown before. It's a brand new design. Yeah. And so 
there's just simply because of that there's an inherent risk a certain amount of risk associated with flying an airplane through the entire envelope for the first time and the second time and the third time until it's proven over and over again so one of the key considerations is you know, he's wearing he's wearing a, a, a helmet you know a full helmet with a really good sound dampening system in it from light speed that allows him to really stay focused and not be too distracted um, he's wearing a parachute but he also needs to be if he has to be able to get out he needs to be able to get out real quick right now so what those handles are when you see a piece of red tape or orange tape around that it typically means test airplane emergency something or another that's what that is so what those do is those are actually coming through up here and they come down to these pins and these pins if you pull that handle they come out and the door the transparent door on here simply falls away and disappears and then he can just get out of the airplane if he needs to. Okay. So that's a test airplane only kind of thing, right? That's not a that's not something you're gonna see in the final airplane. That's specifically because this airplane is in our engineering test phase. Understand, okay. So that also confirms that this being the hinge pins are in the front, this will be forward opening door. Yeah, swings forward door. The doors will go through some change between now and the time that we have the final design of the airplane. This isn't the final design. As we continue to test, make adjustments, and iterate, work toward that final design, all of those things will be determined. Now these are rather flat. Are you considering a bubble to be able to look outside the airplane? We've talked about that, but what's amazing is that there is a little bit of a curve in the airplane right here. So you actually get a little bit of extra room just because of the door, no structure really in there being curved. Um, you can see, you can basically look straight down as it is right now. It's, it's pretty darn amazing. So too much of a bubble just adds drag, right? And we're not we're not looking to build drag on this airplane. We're looking to be able to not have to add drag to slow down, except when the flaps come down all those degrees, right? But the idea is just a, a wing with a lot of wing area, uh, so that we can get up and go, get down. But you know, we don't. We want this airplane to be able to go as fast as it can for longer cross countries, and then also do the very best that we can on the low end in terms of distances and speeds for getting it out. We are partnering with great companies like Dynon Avionics at Dynon.com, AirTech Coatings at AirTechCoatings.com, Aviation Youth Magazine at AviationUSA.com. The Aviators Clinic at aviatorsclinic.com. Take a moment to go visit their websites at the links found below in the description of this video. And visit our website at experimentalaircraftchannel.com for events, our video library arranged in easy to find playlists on specific topics, affiliate products, aviation merchandise, and so much more. So Greg, I saw the video you guys put out, and you're, you're lifting the wing tip and, and wiggling it back and forth, yeah, and it yeah. looks like uh, the suspension is, is quite soft and uh, absorbing. So yep. can you talk about a little bit of the engineering involved and, and the purpose behind that? Sure. Now, you know, I'm not an engineer, but I can describe it to you in, you know. In layman's terms. In average guy's terms, okay. I suppose <laughs> I would say. So, I mean, I'm a pilot, right? So I'm not an engineer. So this looks like a spring gear leg, but it's not. It's actually a very, very rigid gear leg. This gear leg is about three times as rigid as the as the leg over on the RB14 behind you over there. Um, instead, what this has is it articulates around a pivot point and a set of a mechanism that's actually internal to the airplane. So this aircraft has a full flat floor, front to back, and a flat bottom. And in the very small space between here and there, which you can't see from the top or the bottom, is for each gear leg there are actually two pneumatic shocks so an oil nitrogen shock and uh, that dampens the mechanism when the gear when you're putting the, the, the load on the gear and also dampens it when the load comes off and of course there are airplanes there are bush airplanes out there that are flying around with something along those lines but but what we've done is we have uh, from a, a, a leverage perspective right and, and the mechanism that's inside is, is unique and, and works pretty darn well so you get really really good dampening on the way up and on the way out so the spring gear right you get the dampening coming in and then you, you know especially if you watch them in slow motion you can see them the airplane comes off the ground and, and it does this right it throws you off the ground it's springing this is different it's going to come down and then nice and easy it comes back out allows you to stay on the ground avoid the bounce 
allows you to get in shorter, you don't go flying again. You know, the, the types of things that you want in an airplane that you're going to take into short places and put down in rough spots. So Greg, looking at uh, pieces and parts on this thing here, is there anything that is shared control surface wise or anywhere from other models of the aircraft you built or is this all a clean sheet design? There's, we made every piece of metal that's on this airplane and it is a clean sheet design. Firewall forward for the test machine for this particular one, we borrowed firewall forward substantially from the RV-14. Right? It's the same engine, some of the same configuration, not exactly, but, but this is all new parts. So we're not, we started from scratch, knowing what we know and, and built from there. Is this a stabilator? This is a full-flying stabilator. Okay, so, so, so looking at this, uh, at first it looked like it was just a normal uh, horizontal stab in, in LA, but it's not, it's a stabilator. No, it's a stabilator. So the only aircraft that we have a stabilator on is the RV-12. Right? So, but when you, what's the reason for stable? Yeah, what's right? the so, advantage? What's yeah, the advantage of that? Well, when you get going really, really slow, right? When you're at a high alpha, the stabilator gives you a lot of variability in terms of maintaining authority because the big surface area is all in control um, and gives you more options and better envelope expansion from a maintaining authority perspective when it gets to going really, really slow and getting the nose super hot. So you're thinking is forget the typical horizontal stab and elevator and putting VGs on it. We'll just move the whole entire surface. Yeah, we want, we want to avoid putting extra things on the airplane that cause severe pitching moments, right? And slats, for example, or that cause, you know, great visibility problems, add drag to an airplane that we want to go fast. So the design of this airplane is really around maintaining really good visibility. Uh, and if you build it right the first time from the very beginning, and we can find a way to be able to get the airplane exactly where you want it in the different speed regimens and the different operating uh, phases of flight, that's really what we're working to do. We want to try to do that without having to add a lot of other mechanisms to the airplane. All right, so the big question all of us home builders want to know is what is it like to put this together? What will it be like? Right. We, is this any, any jig required? Are we able to build this on any table? What does that look like? Well, you'll want a table. You want a table? You want a table, yeah. Uh, Pre-punched, matched hole, final size construction, just like an RV-14 or an RV-12, right? That's, that's really the idea. Uh, should be probably in some ways even easier to build than an RV-14 or an RV-12. Like we talked about earlier, the option of blind rivets, or we believe we're going to be able to do it where you could choose to do solid flush rivets. So the ease of construction, there's some variability in that, but certainly offering options. Um, you know, we have a lot of machined parts on this airplane, and that's a new thing for us, right? You know, over the last couple of years, we've added uh, CNC machining uh, to our factory, and that has allowed us to think about the way that we do this. It's allowed us to simplify certain parts. From a wing perspective, we don't have a spar carry through, right? We have a strut. It's a different kind of spar. It's actually a lot easier to build, uh, and it's lighter. So, it should be really, really easy to build. It's one of the things I'm kind of excited about. When I build mine, I'm looking forward to knocking it out and getting it done and going flying. So we can't we can't talk about a bush plane and not talk about a tailwheel, right? Of course. So what have you guys done in the engineering department for the tailwheel? So is it lockable? Is it full swivel? All the details. No, it's a lot. It's a locking tailwheel. Yep. Uh, but there's some really cool things about the tailwheel, right? So, first of all, just like the main gear has the pneumatic shock absorbing mechanisms, there's also one on the tailwheel. And if you look at it, this tailwheel doesn't stick way way out on an arm. It's it's close in. It has this pneumatic shock that's in an almost vertical orientation. So some of the problems with tailwheels, you know, that you that you find is you get a lot of shimmy, springs wear out. There's a number of problems that can happen in in the world of tailwheels, right? And especially when you're beating on them really, really hard. Uh, this is designed and built in a way to last a long, long time and to be adjustable. So the four bar design on this allows you to change wheel sizes and then make adjustments on the tailwheel in order to maintain the proper geometry to get the maximum benefit out of the mechanism. It's a, it's a pretty darn nifty design. So the engineer that designed the main gear up front also designed the tailwheel on the back as a system to be able to work together. One of the cool things about doing that and taking a lot of that energy into those shocks and into the suspension itself instead of transferring most of it into the airplane, taking it and absorbing it as heat in the shock mechanisms, is it means that the rest of the airplane doesn't get beat up as hard either, right? And so that's just a general benefit, whether it's for the person who's sitting in the airplane 
you know, or every now and then, it's just the world of airplanes, you know, people get into situations where things start to hit really, really hard. So, you know, whether it's a crash or a mishap type of situation, it also allows us to provide some level of additional protection for the person who's in the airplane and then also help to maintain the longevity of the airplane itself. All right, so now into the, the second most important thing other than construction. Okay. What is the price Dollar. point? What is the price point of this <laughs> and uh, when could it possibly be available? Okay, so the answer to both those questions is we can kind of guess at it at this point in time. So until we get through the full engineering process, until we come to the point where we know exactly what the final airplane looks like, it'll be substantially like this, but there'll be some differences. We won't know exactly when the first kit is available and we won't know exactly what it's gonna cost. Logic would say, just based on the size of the airplane, and we know uh, how many rivets in it, we know about how much material is in it, it's probably going to be somewhere in the in the category of like an RV14 from a cost perspective. So, if you look at the price of an RV14, I think that it, you know, give or take some, that you know, it's going to be somewhere in that range. As far as availability goes, we have some work to do before we can actually get kits out the door. Now, we're planning, at least at this point in time, to when we do kits, is to have the first kit available. We think it'll be in the 12 to 18 month time frame. But when we release the first kits, they probably won't have the paint by number style step by step by step plans that you would get with an RV14 if you did that today for example. But we'll still be comprehensive enough for somebody to be able to build the airplane but it may not be quite that level of detail and then we'll follow on with a more detailed set of plans. There's some new technology out there that we're looking at to try to find ways to do construction plans in a way that may not take quite as much time as it took for example to do the plans for the RV14 which took almost three times as long to do those as it did to actually build a prototype airplane. So it's a significant amount of work both sure. to create and maintain those plans. So we're trying to find ways to be able to make that a little lighter weight for us and for customers as well.